Hi team, welcome back to New Money Rules. Uh, I'm Kyron Goss, the Freedom Investor, where we're exploring how money, business and property works in a post-pandemic world. My guest today is Tama Singh. Tama is a, a young fella. He's a property investor, a flipper. Uh, welcome to the show, Tama. Thank you very much, Kyron. As you get older, the young compliment uh, you know, goes goes longer <laughs> as you get older. So thank you for that one. Yeah. Well, it, it probably works because, uh, you know, I, I once upon a time was the young fella. In fact, even ran young Kiwis in property. Yeah. And here I am pushing, well, I'm past 35 now, pushing 36 in a month or so going like, Still eh. look good, still look good. But I mean, as long as you're hanging around with people who are older than yourself, you're always the young one yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's the and, and, you know, we grow old, but we'll always be immature. Yeah, 100%. Speaking of which, um, I have been told uh, that I need to ask about the details of the company name that you're currently operating before we jump into all the property stuff, because it sounds like there's a bit of a story around that. Yeah, it is. I mean, like any any time you get to create a new company, you know, as long as it's not crazily offensive, um, you can name it whatever you want, right? Yeah. And as a huge Marvel fan growing up, I was like, oh, okay, what am I going to call it? And as you know, when you're putting offers on a sale and purchase agreement, some buyers might go into the fact of what is this called? You know, these things where I go into like racism can come in, you know, there's, a yeah. there's ageism, all this type of stuff where, where a buyer will be like, no, I think they've got more money because their name, you know, just people think of this, right? So yeah. I was like, yeah. I should call my company like frail old poor woman and limited. Just so when I put my low ball offers in, they're just like, you know what? You know what, honey? We're going to give it to them. But what I ended up doing instead <laughs> was the exact opposite. And I called it Asgard Investments Limited, which is like the gold city of like Thor. <laughs> so I totally went 180 on that one. Um, and I ended, ended up calling it Asgard Investments. Nice. And any any younger person is going to understand immediately and, and you know, know probably love yeah. it. Any old people... <laughs> Well, no idea, but it, it came to the point where they might think, oh, this sounds like a very rich, wealthy company. We're not going to sign this low ball. But then I realized that, you know, you just put your name on the sale and purchase and that nominates to your contract, to your company after the deal's gone unconditional anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I can bet you within about an hour of this podcast going out, frail old poor woman is going to be <laughs> taken in the company's office anyway. In fact, maybe I'll snag beat all you to yeah, it. Yeah. I've already I, one checked some where it's like cash unconditional limited. So you call it that. So when the agent calls the vendor, like, hey, we've got an offer. It's from a, a cash unconditional. And they're like, what? Okay, just come around now. <laughs> and they come around and the company's name is called cash unconditional. <laughs> but it's like 80 grand below asking. <laughs> Oh, that's cheeky. That's I, a funny, funny joke, but it's available. I love that. And um, I think a lot of this ties into the way you do property anyway, right? Like been following you on Insta for a few years now, yeah. followed your journey all the way through, absolutely loving what I what I see and, and the evolution that's come out of it. Um, do you want to tell me sort of what got you inspired into property and what made you decide to flip property? Um, well, the thing is with property in general, you know, the rules there that people have heard, it's the biggest millionaire builder of, of all time. You know, I read that quote from Andrew Carnegie, the guy who pretty much made steel in America, right? Like when he said something else outside his field, that's when I was like, okay, property is it. And then you read about New Zealand's benefits of, you know, of in investing here with the tax rules before, you know the new ones, but even then still pretty good. We don't have stamp duty and all that type of stuff that everywhere else has those default paper I fees. I still can't believe that, right? That's a thing. Australia, England, yeah. you have to pay the government for the right to buy a house. My yeah. mate has just bought his home in London and the amount he had to pay the government just for the right to buy a house. Yeah. Insane. Cr crazy. So, so that part was, was good. And then you realize the lifestyle of becoming sort of a property investor where I, I guess if you like in today's cancelable type world, if you are a successful property investor, you can't really get canceled because it's the type of job where you're just working for yourself. You can just buy and flip properties, make your income. And if you're prolific online, like I am, and I had to find two things that was like something I'm passionate about, but eventually if you, you mess up and you get canceled for some reason, your income can't stop. So Do you we, get that? Not quite. When we're talking cancelled, are you meaning cancelled by society? Uh, uh, or yeah. are you talking about being made redundant as in, you know, artificial intelligence and automation? Yeah, that's that's the, that's another one. Yeah, of course. Because you <laughs> see everything happening with ChatGPT replacing jobs. So it was something that's like future-proofing, becoming a property investor. Uh, it's a type of product that everyone will need forever. And 
the, the if you're just trying to get a small percentage of the transactions that happen every single day, why not the biggest transaction that's happening in the country every day? It's yeah. property, whether that be commercial or residential. But, you know, that's what I thought. And I said, why don't we just try and get a small percentage out of that pie? And that equates to hundreds of thousands of dollars if you do it right. And it's fun. I talk about it, you know, you get to meet new people. It's not like you earning money at a desk like a, a stock trader where you are on four walls. You are glued to two screens, three screens, but you're not going out meeting cool tradies. You're not out there shouting lunch for your team. You're out there meeting new real estate agents and seeing really cool houses. Like there's a lot of fun to the property game, which helps keep the momentum going up. So that's, that's, that's where I was like, this ticks all the boxes that I want. And you get to travel. Perfect. Around the uh, great country. Perfect. So which parts of the country have you been buying and doing deals in? We've bought pretty much everywhere around the country. <laughs> if we haven't, like um, like from Invercargill to Kaikohe now. Okay, like, so you haven't quite pushed the far, 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 far north. Far north, but Kaikohe is pretty up there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we first started, our very first time we've bought for flipping was April 2021. So two years in a week's time was the first one we bought. And since then, we've gone on to 43. 43 in 43 two years. 43 purchases in that time. Two, yeah, two years. So that's what, about 20-ish per year, yeah. which equates to about one every two weeks. That's fast math. <laughs> it's faster than my brain can handle, bro. But yeah, that's fucking correct. Yeah, Jesus, yeah. It's, it's not bad. So you've talked about we a lot, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, for you to do this by yourself, probably not going to be able to do well, that, one deal said, the, every two. Nah, the fun aspect as well would be gone. Yeah. You know, the, um, the whole um, bouncing ideas off each other. And it mainly started with me and my builder, who's like um, my main sort of business partner. And uh, we started together in the April. We used to do project management work for some other investor. Yeah. And then eventually we were like, we might as well just go off on our own now. You're doing all the work yourself. We anyway. are doing all the work. And then we chose to, we had no money. I always talk about it, that we started off with four grand. Like we had $4,000 in April, two years ago. Yeah. And I was like, we need to look at the cheapest place in New Zealand. And it was Westport. Oh uh, yeah. Down yep. the West coast. Right. Yeah. We saw four bedroom there for 109 or oh, something, but I got it for 192. Okay. And I knew that four bedrooms were going for 400. So I was like, okay, let's see what we can do here. And I went unconditional on it. And I had three weeks to find 40% of that purchase price, which was 78 grand. And I had four and I had three weeks. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So um, balls on the line. Yeah. And, and this is what I love about you. And we'll touch on this very soon. Like, you know, don't let something hold you back. Right. Absolutely. So you're now unconditional. On a 200, what, what did you put as your deposit? I, you'd have to put 78 grand. No, no, no. Oh, for, for purchasing the deposit, yeah. I think I put nil upon settlement. Nice. Yeah, always, yeah, if you can. Yeah, true. I've never actually done that. You don't know until you ask, right? And they get counted. I'm like, hey, they like everything, but they're just concerned about the deposit. They or you? For your commission. <laughs> you don't ask like that, but you find out where the real question's coming from. Well, you know, yeah. And it depends on how far settlement is. If settlement's in 10 days, they don't care. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If it's three months out. Because legally you have three working days to pay it. And by the time it clears, it's seven days. So they're going to get it. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so here you are, you've now unconditional, you're legally committed. If you don't go through, they're going to sue you. Yeah. Uh, how, how'd you make it happen? So this is the whole thing where it's like, I knew that like, say my mum had 20 grand put aside. So I had that preempted. But yep. I'm still bank like, of, bank yeah, of mum. Bank of mum, you know, still 50 grand short. And I went to her, I was like, mum, I need you. She trusts me in what I'm doing. And I was like, I need you to take out a personal loan in your name. And what you do here is you get, I said, I'll do all the paperwork because doing any loan is just a pain in the ass, especially for someone that's middle-aged that doesn't use a laptop type yeah. stuff, right? I will do it all. I just need your pay slips, your bank statement, that's it. Got it all sorted, got out 35 grand and there was a $500 a month payment that you're due to, she's due. So yeah. it's unfair to ask anyone to get a personal loan out to, to help you out when they had to also carry the debt payments per month. Yeah. So you say to them, I will pay for that monthly installment. So it's as if nothing happened. Right, nothing changes in your life whatsoever besides this two hours of pain in the ass filling out paperwork. Yeah. After that, everything goes back to normal. 
as long as I mm-hmm. transfer five hundred dollars to your account every first of the month, whatever. And so she did. So now we're at like six, seven, uh, 50 grand and I still had to find. So I went to my dad and I, and then you leverage. Oh, mom did it. Oh, fine. Here's 15. So I got my dad, but we remember, we still have to like find more. And then eventually I ended up finding from, I think another family member. So this is where you learn to get on well with your family. Right. <laughs> and you leverage money from them. And then eventually I, I think I got, um, I sold something that got me another six and then we could barely, but we could settle. But then what about Reno? We just got a house that's half munted. Like all in. <laughs> There's a reason it's worth 198, then right? To, then, then you have to fly the get there. Like this is Westport, right? You got you can't even fly direct. You have to fly to Blenheim or Nelson and then drive three hours. So there's flights, there's rental car, there's food, there's materials, there's hourly rate charges for the guys. Like all of that I have to figure it out. And that's when it's like, well, excuses or just fucking get it done. Credit card. Get the credit card out. Um I had another side business, use that credit card as well, just everything to just get it done. And then um, as I am, like while we were down there starting the reno, my partner, Harlem, he was just like, well, there's another house for sale literally down the road. <laughs> and this is where we, we, we started to just to go mental because there was a 180 square meter villa that reminds me of like a Ponsonby villa. Okay. And it was for sale and they wanted like 150 for it. It was like the hoarder's dream house. And we ended up getting it for 120 and I just went unconditional on it. And I knew we'd have to somehow figure this out again. And at the same time, you know, you join, you you get on well, start contacting other property investors, you know, and then some of them was like, well, I've got money, but I haven't got enough to buy a house. I might have 40 grand, 50 grand. It's like, what are you planning to do with that? Maybe you could invest with me and I can give you a return. Yeah. And then out of the blue, and it's that whole thing where, not spiritual energy, but manifesting. But when you when you start to do things right, then things just start to fall on your lap. Yeah, it's crazy how this happened. We we have a saying that it's uh, action leads to traction, which leads to attraction. Yeah. So as you say, if you hadn't have just gone, you know, believed in yourself that you could make it work, go unconditional. We'll figure out a way. That's the action. Yeah. You get down there, you you start, you know, credit carding, making yeah. the reno happen. Yeah. Um, you find the next one. Now you've got traction, which means people start noticing. Hey, and um, I mean, that's why we're even here, right? Yeah, because exactly. I noticed from your socials, like, what's Tamar up to? What? Yeah. And this, others this is see different that. different from last time I saw yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. And others see that as luck when they didn't know that it was a bit of hard work and, you know, you know, hard times. And the other cool, cool trick is obviously if you open up a trade account and like come out of 10, you don't have to pay for anything until the following month. So that helped when we had no money. So mm, if you can get that and of course, sort of, and it gives you with a builder, weeks. he's already got that credibility. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So that's another little cheat there, but it was in my name. For, so it was all on me. They didn't care about his background it was on me. So you have to convince them like, Hey, this is what we're doing. If you, if you open this account for us, we will promise to spend money here. You know, we're looking at other properties. We can only buy it from one place. We'd be loyal. All that stuff you report, 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 you know, sales skills comes into it. Right. And, um, and then one of my brokers who, um, I used to use calls me up and he's like, Hey man, just catch up. You know, I haven't seen any deals come ahead. I was like, Oh, well, I'm starting to do flipping now. And normally, you know, I'd use a different broker for each type of yeah. uh, product. And he's like, oh, well, we've always wanted to do flipping, but we haven't got a team or the time, but we've got a bit of money. And I'm like, oh, really? And he told me how he's got a bit of money, like over 60 grand or something. And I was like, well, why don't you invest that with me? And then that ended up paying for that 120 house. Oh, so I love So it just started that. to happen like I that. I love that. The attraction, right? Yeah, the attraction. Yeah. And then from there, it was like another one unconditional on a Podiki. And then I used like, other stuff for my buy and hold portfolio where I just second mortgage that, yeah, which is very expensive to do. Um, but because we knew that we were going to end up doing the renos and we would sell it, the risk was sort of minimized, but it's just expensive. Add it to the numbers. Does it still work? Like the documentation fee, interest fee, just for signing up the second mortgage was like eight grand. Yeah. Gone. Instantly. Yeah. 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 Just those, on paperwork. Those second tier lenders and asset lenders will yeah. take every dollar yeah, they, they can, can, right? But so... But by like April, May, by May, we're three properties in. And then I learned the whole contemporaneous tricks. And uh, the thing is when I do say 43 properties, some of them have been like two houses, one title, but I still count them as two because, you know, there's two separate incomes. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, <laughs> in case someone wants to title search my company and rip me apart online. Well, he's only done 28. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know? Haters going to hate, bro. Yeah. It's like, well, okay, 28 then. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of renovating. Look at these hands. Yeah. So are you are you actually in there doing the work yourself? Or? No, I have gone down and painted a few times, like with like probably four of them. But other than me, no, I'm my, my partner, he's just like, no, nah, you just stay on the laptop, bro. You just find more deals and you know, do everything else that comes with it, the sales part, marketing, staging, negotiating the agents' fees and looking for the next one, finding buyers. Yeah. I, I guess this is where uh, working in a team, we start to really understand how we each have our own roles, what we do, what we do, do well. And you've yeah. always been a, a good salesman. Um, you've always had the gift of the gab and that yeah, sort of helps. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well it, it not necessarily helps, but it means, you know, I'll take this role. And just as I imagine your builder is good at what he does, which is why he does that part. That of part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how you, you've talked a lot about relationships. How has building relationships, holding relationships, keeping those relationships, how has that helped you to get to where you are today? Having done 48 ish. Yeah. Well, I mean, everything comes down to like, um, not, not to burn the bridges and New Zealand is an actual tiny place. And when you go into a niche of like a property investor, like the good ones, it's again, a very small pool where nearly all of them have either heard of their name definitely, or they've, they've met them because you know, the small meetups, the property investors association, or they they follow the same people online and with social media, it's just two clicks. Oh, blah, blah follows it. Or they've commented, oh, they look like they're, they know their stuff in this comment. So I might check out their page, boom, follow. So like just, just that type of stuff is very important. Again, that you have to be careful of what you're posting online because of that very reason. Um, and then there's things where with agents that, you know, you've, you've done well by and it might be 18 months from two years ago when I started, they, they send me a deal. Hey, are you still looking in this area? I was like, yeah, okay. You know, and, um, sometimes Can it make me money. Of, yeah, course, of course I'm still looking. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, and they, they might bring you off market deal. Um, but it's just relationships everywhere that helps you to get to an efficient, like 40 plus properties so to your insurance broker that can do the nightmare m mistake fix within four hours before settlement because the loan docs were wrong and the insurance certificate was in the wrong company's name and settlements due at like 3 p.m. And the insurance person has to go and they're like, well, uh, we need insurance. Uh, uh, we need quotes for insurance. Like all your properties need to be insured now for an extra 60 grand each. Why? Because the GST comes into it. Some bullshit like that. And you're like, oh my God, can you change the insurance certificates from like every other property I own? Um, yeah, give us a couple of hours and we'll get it done. It's like, oh my God. And then seven or something insurance certificates comes through to make sure that second mortgage goes through. Some shit like that, you know? And they do that and answer the phone and, and prioritize you because of the business you give them, the loyalty you've given them. And I think like nearly everyone that I've gone through since I started in April 2021, I've stuck to them. My same flipping broker, my same lawyer, my same accountant, my same insurance broker, property managers, real estate agents that I've used. Yeah. So that goes a long way, right? I, I find it interesting because we talk about people being self-made. Right. And in this instance, like, you know, there's, there's no doubt about it. You're self-made in the traditional sense, but no one thinks about the fact that it, it comes as a team. Absolutely. And if it wasn't for the insurance broker, the lawyer, the agents, you wouldn't have any properties. You wouldn't have any deals. You wouldn't be making any money. Correct. And we, you talked, you started by saying, uh, Kanigi talking about how, you know, property and, and, you know, that's where most millionaires are made. But anytime someone becomes a millionaire or, you know, even the billionaires, you look at their network and who they work with and everyone's risen together. Yeah. Which is where I think why that is so important. People Absolutely. People always and, be loyal. And there's the other side where it's like, um, even not for me, but just how humans are, the self, the selfishness of it. They start earning a lot of money and then they're just like, why the hell am I doing all this? I don't want to do this. I want to go fishing. I don't want to play golf. I don't want to do anything else. Walk the dog. So then they start bringing in more people. And they realize that in order for their time to continuously be free to play with the dog, that person needs to be trained. That person needs to be within the business and more, more responsibilities. So through their own selfishness, they have to create the team because no one wants to just be rich as hell behind a desk all day. Because the point of being rich and having that financial freedom is to fucking do fun shit. <laughs> and you can't do that with your entire team with you on the yacht every day. Cause there's no money. No one's making <laughs> money. So eventually like having that team there. Um, and you know, these are the people that want to be that team cause they want to learn 
for that five years, because when you're five years ahead of them or whatever, and then eventually they'll be the ones on the yacht with their own team. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So the selfishness is, is for the billionaires, they bring the team in because they don't want to be doing any of the work eventually, you know? It's like when someone gets wealthy, we'll just talk about outside. You don't clean your own house anymore. No. You know, why would you? You're like, how much does this cost? $300? I will pay someone to do, I do not want to do this. Leave me on my laptop to do something, right? Or, oh, how much is dinner? Why don't we just Uber eat something? I don't want to pay to go cook and slave for two hours. So money starts buying that stuff to free up your time. But the team is definitely, um, as self-made, you know, one of the people I follow a lot is Arnold, right? Sort of singer, yeah, yeah. millionaire before he even hit acting through yeah. property. That's a crazy cool fact. Um, yeah, he said there's no such thing as a successful self-made person. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, back to the whole cleaning thing. I had a cleaner in my tiny house. Oh my god! <laughs> and people yeah. used to laugh. But she came like, after the floods, did she? Yeah, well, <laughs> we we won't mention that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we've moved from a tiny house now, and yeah, we've still yeah. got the cleaner. But yeah, just just people don't think about the value of their own time, and if you can spend that you know, one hour or two hours or whatever. I don't know how long it takes to clean a normal house. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can find a deal which is going to make you 50 to 100K. It doesn't even have to make you that much. It can make you like 15 grand. Yeah, just, or do a contemporaneous. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. something small, like 10 grand. It's like, that's an hour. And then obviously there'll be follow-up. Maybe, who cares if it's 40? That's a week. That's a wage in New Zealand at what, 800, $900,000? This is 15 grand for 40 hours. Yeah. When you quantify it like that, you know? Everything comes down to, well, what are you doing normally all the time now? It's like, well, you might be working 40 hours. What do you take home after tax? 1,200 if you're lucky in New Zealand? Okay. You know, yeah. find a deal instead of cleaning and there might be 10. And then obviously the whole, the whole part of it, if you can do all this while still working, imagine what you can do if you weren't working. Absolutely. That's the other main thing, right? There's other things where it's burned the boats, you know, but there's also the things where it's like, oh, is the recession coming? And there's other ways of banks looking at serviceability where income does help and heaps of other things where, um, oh, just, just like uh, putting yourself out there, knowing more people will eventually help, right? So some people will weigh it up different ways at work. Um, if you are working full-time job and wanted to get into property, you know, talk to, let people know in your company that you are wanting to do property investing because chances are property is such a big thing and it's such an important thing in wealth that everyone knows about it because they grew up when they were like 10 and there's a reason why they had to move houses every bloody year because they were renting, their parents were renting, they never owned. So people know what it is and you might talk to them, might be like, oh, we might invest, we have cash or we have equity in a house. We've always wanted to do something with it yeah. and you've just got a circle of people at your work that you already know because you've known them for five years. Who do you think they're going to look to once you start killing it in property? Probably the person there. And especially if you manage to quit your job and go into property, of course they're going to believe you <laughs> 10 times more. So you've got this whole bunch of new investors that you've just groomed over five year period because you had this plan at, at the start. It's funny, our obsession with property, hey? Like I know I've, I've raised business for, I've raised, I've raised money for business and I've raised money for property. And property, people jump at property. Business, oh, uh, yeah, but yeah. property, yeah. they don't even think twice. And like you say, noobs who just don't know anything yeah. are happy to put the money into property. Yeah, the business one, especially po is this post-COVID mainly as well? Oh, both, Difficulty? Yeah. yeah. I guess it's just the whole thing of um, if they're educated more towards, they'll be looking at you know what the governments are doing and they're raising their hourly rates and how that's going to stress out businesses and all that type of stuff, you know. But with residential property, um, yeah, it's just you know that there's a housing shortage, tenants shortage. Um, it will, you know, like the capital gains will eventually come right. So, and it's just brick and mortar. They can drive past it, see it. You know, touch it with yeah. the business. Thing. That's what they love, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's hard to just change the use of it. Like with the business, it's like, oh, you could be doing this. That might not be working. So if I can try and change it to selling ice cream now at the shop, <laughs> that ain't going to work. And they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, that wasn't what we thought we, we agreed on, you know? You know, so business is a bit more more risky, but money to be made in both, right? If you've got the right circle and yeah. know what you're doing. Well, probably an interesting point because you would have started mindset wise, you started as a property investor, moved to a property flipper. Mm. At what point did you realize you were flipping so many properties? You've actually now just created a business out of it anyway. Um, I mean, I think it's when we had like seven on the go at once. 
we was like, we just stopped, we just stopped counting after like 30. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, I do up a spread and I just nail them all off the top of my head and I put them on a document. I just stare at them. I'm like, page two. <laughs> how, how does, yeah. how does one person manage seven renovations at a time? I think that it'd be split with obviously my builder. Yeah. Would probably take on at least 50% of that. Yeah. But that's, that's the only way, you know, and, it, and we, 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 we know we can get better. We know we can do better. Like we are not doing it as good as we can. Yeah. And like, I know that for a fact. And, and that's exactly what we mean by yeah. your property flipping has now turned into a business, right? Yeah. Because it's about systems, about staff. You talked before about bringing in the staff so you can go sit on the yacht or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I know, you know. Um, and, and that's a business where the product you flip, it just happens to be property. And we started off by saying, well, that's where the huge margin is. I mean, if you're making a 10% margin and you're dealing with three, $400,000 properties, well, that's thirty, forty thousand dollars mm. $40,000 as a margin. If you're dealing with $3,000, I don't know, what's Cameras. the phone? Well, yeah, you know, and yeah. you're making 10% margin, you're making 300 bucks. bucks. You've got to sell a lot more. Yeah, correct. That's why it's like the percentages of the transaction that's happening in New Zealand, the biggest ones is real estate, yeah. full stop. It's farms, commercial warehouses, whatever it is, it's linked to real estate. So that's where it's like, and you know, it's this type of things I talk about with other people where you know, I've known a lot of friends that are doing jobs where it's like maybe sales, salesperson, you're making the phone calls, you're making, you're doing the emails. It's like that equates to you earning your hourly wage of say $30 an hour, or whatever it is. The same things you do on your fingertips where you type on this and the same, same carbon dioxide that comes out of your breath when you speak like this literally could translate to 10 times that if it was just on property. You're already a salesman. You're already doing what your boss is asking you to do. You just need to figure out the knowledge and then do it for yourself. You know, that's, that's what it is, especially when it comes to, to, to real estate. It, it's so funny. I've, I haven't shared this with you, but I've recently come up with a education model called the wealth ladder, oh, yes. which literally talks through like, you know, you think about someone like you're just talking about what they do as an employee, they could do for themselves and make 10 times the money. Or what is the difference between someone who's a chef down at the local cafe yeah. who get, I don't know how much they get paid now, but let's say somewhere between 50 and a hundred and someone like Gordon Ramsay, who's still a chef. Yeah. He just does it all in a different way, right? And that's just that different mentality as you you climb, start to climb the ladder. People think wealth is about having dollars in your bank account, but it's actually the, the way you look at things, the way you look at problems, the way you solve them and, and the mindset you have. How have you noticed, you know, like even when we met way back, you were running your own business, but how have you noticed the business you ran back then? versus this property business. Well, this is way more hectic, right? Like the <laughs> amount, as I said, like seven renovations on at once. And then you've got, um, you know, the investors and stuff like that, that you're always thinking of, you know, paying them, paying them back out and renewing um, tenancies from all that type of stuff. But, and then we're at the point now that we've flipped, 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 and you want to retain the asset, right? You want to hold. And so that's where it's like, we got to 40, and it's like, we've made a bit of cash. We've, we've paid back investors to the point we've solidified and say we went to, I always think of it like this, say we went to uni to learn about property Yeah. for what is that? Two and a half years, three years, four years. I think it's a four year yeah, degree. Some bullshit, yeah. right? some bullshit. So I was like, cool. And then we would have made nothing. No, that. you'd be in yeah. student and we debt have, of 80 we grand. We probably wouldn't have touched more than like three properties in real life to do a reno. And then you have to start where we've done it practical made money and our, our experience is like through the roof like what the amount we've done should have taken people like 10 years 43 properties in two years that's crazy right i've heard that one of the people i've sat down with he said he's like one of the biggest prophylic flippers in new zealand he's done over 350 and i'm like 350 yeah but that's in like 15 years right and i'm like well we're 43 in two years if I wanted to, could probably beat that <laughs> eventually. Because, I mean, who knows? You could start counting like 12 unit apartment blocks and that'd be a cheat, right? You could definitely <laughs> exceed that, right? It depends who's asking. But, um, yeah, it all just comes down to like, we got to the point now we were like, we want to hold some assets. And then I don't know if you saw that post that I saw that um, massive boarding house daycare center up in Kaikoui. 
Oh, I can't remember. You so might have to refresh so me on it. That's the one where I'm like, we need to keep this because it's got to be 10 bedrooms and we're going to r- rent it out a single boarding house at like $200 a room. Yeah. And that's two grand a week. And it was listed for like 580 plus just in Kaikoui with yeah, 1,900 yeah. square meters. Yeah. And we got it for 440. And it's probably going to be like all in costs at like 600. Yeah. And then the yield on that at two grand a week. Oh, I can't even do those numbers in my 16% head. 16% maybe? Yeah, probably. Interest deductible? Oh, true, true, yeah. true, true. So why would we sell that one? Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So we bought that February 28th. Haven't done anything to it because the mortgage is 220 because we got 50% lending yeah. on the 440. Um, we had to pay just on that, so it was 506. But yeah, that's one would keep. Would you not be GST zero rated? Um, the, for that holding company, yes, but still the sale was whatever oh. plus GST. Yeah. Have yeah. you settled yet? Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, well, your lawyer knows what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, I'm and not the, gonna... accountant, the accountant had to review it yeah. and my lawyer for that one. Not going to get in and the nitty gritty with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I love that. And like, th- this ultimately comes back to that idea, you know, if we think about the flipping as as a business, now you're just sinking your business profits down into just assets, right? Investment correct. assets for yeah. long term. Yeah. So yeah, that will be, is that owned by yourself or is that part of the That's just a holding trust. By yourself? Yeah. Like, okay, cool, cool, yeah. cool. And then we've got two more that we just settled on March 28th. That was last week. Yeah. And those were two, three bedrooms um, with brand new garages on them. And that was in the Bay of Plenty. And we got those for 485 for both. So most people would be sitting here going like, oh my God, property is so weird, so hard, so how do I get started? You're doing deals all over the country from your laptop here in Auckland. Yeah, yeah. How do you manage that? So um, again, whenever whenever you've gone to any place and you've used anyone, like you've got a Sparky to come in just to do a landscaper, handyman, property manager, save all their numbers on your phone with something that you like, you know, Sparky, blah, blah, blah. Even what, they, what he looks like, who cares? Name, <laughs> Invercargill. And then you follow up with a text. Hey, mate, thanks for visiting XYZ Street. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Here's my name. Something that, because eventually when you when you do so many projects, you lose track of what that person's name was, what you even asked them to do, blah, blah, blah. But phones are computers, what people need to realize. Yeah. You go into the search messages and you just type in the address of the house and it'll pull up every tradie that you've ever sent to that house. Mm, and it'll true. come up with the sparky, the plumber, the landscape the flora, the blah, blah, blah. And now you've got them to relate back to their texts and be like, oh yes, hey mate, before settlement, the fucking oven was not wired and probably can you go back and, you know, small things like that, um, which helps um, being efficient when it comes to having a guy on the ground. Obviously you have to have someone there that you can call all the time um, and having a guy that's available like a handyman or that can do the small stuff that your team, your primary team would have missed or not had time to for cheap. Yeah. Like a landscaper would probably do rubbish removal, you know, stuff like that, that you'd, you'd get him to do just anything. He's got a truck, transport a chattel, like an oven, you know, add it onto your fee. So stuff like that, that makes it way easier. Yeah, and without having to pay building teams or- Correct, or the or hourly rate yeah. for something like that, you yeah. know. And then whenever we go down there- um, Booking nice accommodation as nice as you can afford for the guys because I fly them all around the country. That's a key thing as well. So we've got, you know, we've got our own builder, plasterer, laborers, plumber. The only person we don't have to fly around is a Sparky, but we have good connections wherever we are for, for our electrician. Yeah. And then, you know, every time dinner, food, all paid for, plus like uh, $500, $1,000 night on the piss. Yeah. On the Saturday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just those little things to make yeah. them feel appreciated. Correct. Oh, perfect. Let's um let's change tact a little bit. Um obviously when we first met, you were quite big on Instagram anyway. Um you're doing a lot of comedy. comedy skits, yeah, 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 yeah. The shit that'll get me cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that yeah. real dodgy toe the line type stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um you've recently or oh, Maybe recently, you 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 have since then transitioned to predominantly talking property. Yeah. Um, what drove the transition? Well, it's what pays you. That's literally it. It's like at the end of the day, it's like I would have loved to just continue doing the the, the comedy stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like I got too good at at the properties type stuff 
that and then like just talking about it in ways that the layman's can understand it. And if you want to appeal to the masses, you have to understand that there are. So this is weird. It's like if I talk completely freely, it's like cancel, cancel, cancel time. Like <laughs> but it's the truth. It's like there are more um, less educated people towards wealth building skills than there are not. So wait, you, say that again. So there are more numbers of people that are less educated in wealth building stuff. That's yeah. why there's more poor people in the world. That's why the one percent is this thing called the one percent. Then, then others that are more educated on wealth building. So if you want to just appeal to the masses, yeah. you go and you talk to the people that are middle class, right? Yeah. If you want to niche it to the really wealthy stuff, you're running like ads on LinkedIn. You're, you're doing really good blog posts on LinkedIn type stuff, you know? Yeah. Where like career driven, more wealthy type people would be on. But if you look at platforms such as like Instagram, Facebook, where just any man and his dog can just sign up and start throwing racial comments whenever they want. That's the masses. Right? You keep that's throwing cool. racial yeah. out. Have you <laughs> had a few? <laughs> Not yet. That's where you know you've made it, eh? I'm waiting for them. Bring it nut. <laughs> but that, I would have yeah. thought they'd more comment on that mauve and the yeah, uh, yeah, color yeah, of I your know, skin. For a while. Um, but yeah, if you want to, for me, when I changed my brand to like get maximum exposure, then I, that's when I knew I was like, I need to appeal to like the middle class and maybe even the less than that and teach them how to do it in the actual way where I'm like, look, like even the thing that I talk about with my seminars and stuff and just any training I do, it's, it's like to make 30 to 50 grand. Yeah. I ain't that guy that's going to make you a millionaire unless you like literally a part of the circle or we're doing like crazy one-on-one -on -one masterclass mentorships, right? I ain't going lie to lie to the, the masses. If I'm here trying to help 10,000 people, you ain't helping 10,000 people become millionaires in New Zealand off residential property as like 10 people in a team. That's just not realistic unless it's yeah. Ponzi scheme shit, right? <laughs> so when I say, look, 30 to 50 grand a year, if you knew confidently how to make that yourself after a few trainings every year, that's it. You're, you're living life comfortably now. You well, aren't that's struggling when the rates bill comes, when something happens at the school or injury or medical bill, 30 to 50, because the main thing is you know how to make that. Yeah. So at one point when you did make it, you took your foot off the gas because you were all good. But when shit hits the fan, you've still got those skills. Don't take your foot off the gas. Do it twice in one year. Make 60 to 100. That way, if anything else comes, you're safe. So, but with me, it's like never take the foot off the gas and learn how to make that <laughs> 60 all the time, all the time, you know? So that's where it was um, like turning to the masses and the way that I do my content is to help those people, the 30 to 50, because that's the sh shame shit I grew up with. 30 grand to my parents at one point, fuck, in Christmas Day in July. <laughs> yeah. You and know? I, and, and I suppose they're the ones who need that inspiration i guess the ones yeah. who can be told actually it is possible that it's not only the one percent who can do this anyone can do this yeah you just need to speak the language and get up off your ass which i know uh you're really passionate about helping people to to find no excuses as you know i yeah, i'm the same well. right don't tell me what you can't do tell, tell me what, what you can, can do, do. Yeah, exactly like um that. so so what are some strategies or what are some things that people can do right now if they are sitting at home watching this going like oh yeah well that's easy for them to say they're yeah. sitting there you know well, they've done it the easiest now thing is like if you've got a pen and paper just write down five people's names that you know has money that has equity in their house or money right five people if you can't even do that just just think of their names now you know who they are and then you literally have to devise a plan on how you won't be seen as a complete noob when you ask them for money, because that is your plan. This is a slingshot. If you can ever find huge amounts of capital from other people outside yourself, you are on the slingshot now. Now, all you have to do is be confident that when you take their money, you can follow through on whatever you say. So you have to make sure that you've got a vehicle choice that pays back and like massive amounts of say profit even that covers that. So you aren't going to go take a hundred grand from someone to go start an e-com water bottle business, <laughs> right? Because the margins ain't there. You know how many water bottles you have to sell to even break even and they have the profit, right? But if you could take their money hundred K for a whole year and you can do two flips, 
Because remember, that 100K goes into the purchase price. So even if you're breaking even, that 100K is safe because it came in. Breaking even means you get all the money you put in back, right? Yeah. So when you're doing that, but if you're buying well and you're educated, your margin there should have been at least you walk 20 grand, right? So you're using someone's 100 to give them back and then you might give them 10 grand on top. And so the 30 grand was all in the profit of the deal and you gave them 10 and you kept 20. Say that's all you did for the whole year. You shat yourself, you're like, that was a nightmare. I started <laughs> aging like four years and three months, so I'm done. But you walked with 20. And then eventually you come around and it'll be that person that gave you the money knocking on your door again. Even though you shat yourself, because they'll be there being like, that was the easiest 10K and I've made. I wonder what that dude's up to. And they will come back and be like, hey, why don't you do it again? Like this is just what happens, but you can't just do that with one person. They say no, and then you quit. Because what I always tell people is, especially when it's your parents, eventually they do want you to be doing some crazy ass cool shit. That's just what every parent wants him to do. But they just might not think you're there yet. So I always say to them, go and get the questions that we teach, like the proper way to, to ask them if you're not been a complete asshole kid, is you get the no out of the way as fast as you can. Because eventually, the, you just need them to know that's what you're interested in doing. And then you catch up with them two months' time. And you're having dinner with them. And of course, it's going to come up. Oh, so have you looked into any more of that property stuff you, talk, you, you mentioned last time? And your, your answer needs to be 50 times more knowledgeable now. Mm. You need to have never stopped learning about it. So eventually, they're going to be like, oh, okay. And then something might not happen then. And then six months down the track, you're still trying to make it happen outside of them. You're talking to other investors. You're making other things trying to happen. You're learning deal sourcing, anything that then they feel left out. The parents are now like, he's going to make it now. He's struggling and I can <laughs> see and I have a key in my, my fucking hand just needs to do this. And my son now is in success mode and I have the power to do that. But I said no six months ago because I thought he was not ready. I thought he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And you found that out. So you ask with the expectation they're going to tell you to get fucked just understand no one's just going to give you 100k so expect them to say no but find out with all your power the reasons why and, and re re respond back in that list okay i understand that appreciate that you obviously made that money by being safe and whatever you've done so i am an experience i haven't got someone a mentor that that's there to guide me i haven't got blah blah blah, blah. and then you come back in six months even if it took a year with all of those clean. And then they, then you, you never know, they might, they might be open to doing it. Chances are they might be like, all right, but I get half. Done. Okay. Now I've got a JV partner who's my family member. So all that type of stuff is another way. Then you can do that with your friend's parents. Because at the end of the day, no lie, everyone knows someone with money. It might not even be your whole family. Your whole family could be broke. But your friend's parents aren't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. why you're friends yeah. with them. <laughs> <laughs> and and I guess this is where we start turning it. You know, you you talk about asking for money, but really it's about creating an investment proposition. Yeah, where they're not just giving you a hundred grand; they're expecting the a money return. back, correct? Plus a return on top. Absolutely. And in which case, you remove all the emotion. This is an investment opportunity. Is this something that meets your investment rules or not? Yeah. And you you talk about equity. Pretty much every person, every boomer out there has equity Correct. in their house, yeah. which is just sitting there useless, absolutely useless. And if you can show how they pay the bank 5% on the money and you pay 10% on the money, well, now they're not even using their money. They're using the bank's money, mm. which is what the banks do anyway. Correct. So you just, it's just all education, hey? Yeah. And like, you know, there's second tier lenders that will put security against their house that has half a million dollars equity to release 150. So you can go flip somewhere cheap in the regions. And you're like, oh, but I want to do it in Auckland. It's like, why? <laughs> this is why I'm, I, we've never flipped in Auckland. In the two years, we thought we were going to flip our way to Auckland. Then we started making way, like enough money in the regions. And I was just like, you either go buy an $800,000 house in Auckland to then go spend 100K on renos, to then go sell and make what, 150? Best case scenario, maybe, in this market? So people do that and to make 100. That's just a standard flip, right? Why would you not just buy a $350,000 house and sell it for five hundred dollars and spend fifty? dollars So you're all in at four hundred dollars to, to, to get five hundred. dollars After fees might be eighty, dollars But your return on what you've needed 
is almost the same, but half the price, half the risk, half the amount of capital. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Why would you go in and holding costs at fucking six grand a month for this 800K house in Auckland with way more supply? 800 I, must be cheap in Auckland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Otara. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Even that's probably more than 800. Yeah. Good to call. Yeah. But that's just, that's what I always say to people. You don't need to just, people that are like, nah, I need to do Auckland, Auckland. Ego. Pride. You're, you're ashamed to sell people where you operate. Who cares? Get it going and then show them your bank account. <laughs> well, that's one thing as we start to wrap up. One thing you've been really good at is showing social proof on your Insta, right? Yeah. And that's that's why every time you bloody pop up, I'm like, what's Tummer up to now? And there's, yeah. there's like emails, there's texts, there's, you know, there's fucking you doing- Fucking bank screenshots. Yeah. The green plus signs. <laughs> Here is the money that hit the account today. No one does that. No, no what, one does that. Bro. What made you start that? And to be honest, no I, one else does that. And it's the one thing when I was younger, I was like, where the fuck's the bank account? Show me your bank account. I'm never showing the balance, but I'm showing the deposits coming through that day. So at least people can be like, okay, at least there's that in there. Cause it's like, that's just the most motivating cool shit out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the, people the messages. I, yeah. People that I'm like close with and coming into the group, they're like, Maybe you look at slowing that down in the future because, you know, like screenshots of like quarter million dollars coming into your account is like, how is that helping after a while? Eventually, like, it's like you're getting kidnapped in the car park, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to be in McDonald's getting fucking jumped. <laughs> this is where the racial stuff comes in. Yeah. We'll wrap that up before I get cancelled. Yeah. But I, I think just... um like like the difference, you know, we've seen so many people come through in the past. It, there's so many different educators and gurus in the financial education space. And I, yeah. I love seeing that social proof from your bank accounts, from your students and yeah. you know, people who are coming to your seminars and, you know, just people getting inspired by your Insta. So keep it up as yeah, well. Yeah, 100%. Definitely. Um, as we wrap up, what would be your biggest piece of advice uh, to someone who's watching this, um, thinking about, hey, this all sounds cool. But, but what, what, how do I get started? I guess just understanding if it's going to be property investment uh, to make your wealth, it's huge. Cause like, you know, that there's a saying Jeff Bezos says when it comes like, if you're swinging for the fences, like you only need to hit once and then you're like, you only need to be right once type thing. And when the margins on property are like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, when you give it a go and you start being right on the certain deals you've done, the profits there are massive. It's the easiest way where it's like salary replacement profits type thing, right? Mm, and yeah, if yeah. you think like, oh, I don't know, regardless if whatever your brain is thinking, you're involved in property regardless. You're either the consumer of the property investment, you're the tenant, or you're just the supplier of a home no, own, a homeowner. You're either two things. You're just owning a home or you're renting or you're homeless. <laughs> but now yeah. I'm watching this podcast yeah. right now. So we won't talk about them. But that's the thing. So it's like, just understand that regardless if you're going to get into property or, or give thought about it, you're already in it. So why would you not be on the side that's like, I'm going to try and make money out of this? And, and like you said, uh, it doesn't have to be about going for millions, making 30 to 50K. 30 to 50K is all you need a year, but you need the skill and how to do it without a fluke. That's the key. Because fuck, you can burn that shit down in one, <laughs> one day. You can go blow 30K on a new car and then you're like, now the bills come next week. Where's that 30 gone? I don't know. My mentor did it all done for you service. And I just sat on the couch and drank the whole time. I need to know how to make 30K again. So that's why when you land the skill, that's priceless. Well, it's worth a lot of money because you need to know how to do it. Repeat, repeat, repeat Perfect. without anyone else's assistance after a while. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Tama. Uh, if you want to learn more, Tama is, as we've said, always on Insta, yep. always sharing. So go check him out. What's your Insta handle? Just at Tama Singh, T-A-M-A-S-I-N-G-H. Perfect. And I'll link it down below as well. Thanks so much. We'll be back next week with another show, with another guest uh, exploring how money, property, business works in this post-pandemic world. Cheers, team.